first time I saw Philip was within the radiators of the space. It was in this venue in Morn's Hotel. Uh, they had their first single uh, television screen, which is still a little bit of a punk masterpiece. They looked the part and, and they sounded the part. And they, more than, most importantly, they wrote the part. Like what he was speaking about was, was lyrics that, that meant something to Irish people, to Dublin people. Here was our own Joe Strummer, uh, Johnny Rotten. Well, when we first met Philip, it was we put an ad in the paper. Myself and Pete had been looking for extra members of the band to join. And uh, we'd lost Billy Morley, who was the guitar player at that stage, and we were looking for a lead guitar player. And uh, Philip was one of the people that answered the ad. And Pete and I were out in my house in Port Monarch at the time, and uh, we got this thing kind of the driveway, this sort of Honda 50 put putting along, and this very strange kid in a crash helmet and a big shiny tooth kind of came to the door and we were kind of saying, who's this kid? Doesn't look like Johnny Rotten to us. But um, he sat down and played us a song. It was a great song, a song called Tin Pan Alley Cats. We immediately both knew this guy's got talent. He's a great writer. Um, but we were looking for a lead guitar player, so we kind of passed on him for a couple of weeks. And then I just thought about it. I said, this is crazy. This guy's he seen his ex-pills in the, in the 100 Club. You know, he really knows what we're doing. So rang him back and said, you want to have a go at it? And that's when he joined the band. Dance, dance, dance. I'd really just known Philip initially as a schoolboy, then as this guy who'd written these great songs that the radiators were recording. And, and, and then he said, by the way, I'm, I'm actually sort of, I want you to hear something. I'm working with Peter O'Brien. And I knew Peter. I said, Professor Peter Piano Player and Louis Stewart. I said, what are you doing to these jazz guys? How are you working with them? And he said, oh, I'm producing an album. Bloody hell. I mean, he was, must have been about 17. And uh, still essentially like a schoolboy. And he said, I'm producing an album with them, with Agnes Burnell. And I hadn't heard Aggie at that stage. So he played me some tracks. My mind was absolutely blown. They were perfect. For a small, skinny kid, he carried a huge punch. I remember in He wasn't a straightforward punk rocker. He was far more eclectic and complex. And he brought out a, a, an amazing uh, Captains and the Kings, an EP, uh, Brendan Bean. And, you know, he was jumping from Brendan Bean to, 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 to Kurt Vile and Brecht and then to Oklahoma and Jimmy O'Dea in the Olympia theatres. His references always never cease to amaze me. You mentioned a play to him. And he'd say, yeah, it's such and such a production, that, 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 that the young Vic. And, but I saw a, a such and such off-Broadway. And I saw a production in Rome or Berlin. I just thought, bloody hell. I mean, he, he really took it very seriously. He travelled. Like, some people will travel to art galleries to see specific paintings. Philip would actually travel to see specific plays. Um, but my love... The first time I met Philip, I was really happy to meet him because it's wow, it's Phil Chevron. But my memory is we were all sat, him, me, Shane, maybe a couple of guys from the record stores. We were all sitting in the White Horse pub in Soho. And uh, just Shane and Phil just got into what I later learned was their normal pattern of discourse, which would be these very erudite literary discussions that always became arguments. And my pleasure was always seeing someone who could stand up to Shane. Like, Shane's one of the smartest people you'll ever meet. He's a scholar, and uh, seeing someone who could match him was a real pleasure, and I was really glad it was Phil Chevron. Knowing Philip, Philip uh, mightn't have been satisfied just being, like, a, a playing acoustic guitar in this band. He was obviously, at some stage, to offer up some, uh, some material. Mm. And if you look back, I think he chose his moments very carefully. You know, and any songs that he, he put up became, like, firm favourites between the post set, like, particularly like, everyone knows uh, Thousands of Sailing. Thousands of sailing. Uh, Philip did a brilliant thing. He wrote Thousands of Sailing, which so completely fitted the sound and the whole storyline and what people wanted to hear from the Pogues. It must have been frustrating to say, I've got this idea of a song and I have to fit it into a Pogue-shaped mould or else it won't get heard. And I guess at some point he said, I'm not going to do that. And then he was complicated in that he was also striving with his sexuality. He was uh, um, one of the first sort of out gay men, but kept it quiet in a in an unquiet way. And 
Brandon Cleary's clock. Uh, the song itself is, I mean, Cleary's clock is, I, th I think it still is, sort of like meet you under Cleary's clock and maybe you'll go to Savoy and you might be lucky and get a feel. It's one of those sort of teenage, nubile meat places. And it, it, the song is about a young man waiting to meet another young man and, uh, and the sort of the, the homophobic fear. My absolute favourite thing about it, beyond the beauty of the lyric and learning something about Phil um, and the melody, is that it's about Dublin. <laughs> it's about Cleary's Clock. So Im immediately it's just situated for me and it's eternal. I mean, even, God forbid, Cleary's ever disappears off the face of the earth. We know where it is and we know that Cleary's Clock was there and we know that lovers meet there and we know that Phil was waiting there. And he created this incredibly beautiful, delicate, fragile piece of art that somehow overcome its fragility. It, I mean, this, we're talking about decades ago. He was a really beautiful writer. Philip's main characteristic would be one of certainly loyalty, one of support on any level, not just musically or emotionally or you know, financially. You know. Uh, he was a great friend, you know, I yeah. think, more than anything, I think. He was. Yeah.